Mass UFO sightings, where large groups of individuals supposedly witness the same unexplainable event, are an uncommon, though not unheard of, occurrence. In such cases, the abundance of eyewitness testimonials often lends credence to the claims made. Whether this credence is deserved is not immediately clear, however, and a close examination of even the most seemingly unassailable claims is worthwhile. The Westall School and Aerial School sightings represent two extremes of this particular genre. Separated by 10,000 miles and almost 30 years, somewhat similar events took place, and yet the character of each is utterly different. April 6, 1966 was a beautiful autumn morning in the outskirts of the Australian city of Melbourne, in an area known as Clayton South. Two days before Good Friday, the upcoming Easter holiday break was on the forefront of everyone's mind at the neighboring schools of Westall High and Westall State, a primary school. At the high school, two groups of students, ranging in age from 11 to 16 years, were undertaking a physical education class on the large sports oval, one of the groups playing cricket, the other football. At about 10.15, an unidentified student suddenly stopped what he was doing and called everyone's attention to an object slowly moving through the sky at about five to 600 meters distance. Reports made by witnesses, including students Marilyn Eastwood and Colin Kelly, described the object as more or less disc-shaped and silvery or silvery green in color, generating, as student Joy Tiger described in a contemporary report, a whirring noise. After a time, a minor panic ensued as the perceived enormity of the occasion overtook the onlookers. Many of the students stared in wonderment while others bolted from the field in hopes of finding shelter inside one of the campus buildings. Unable to continue with instruction, physical education teachers who were on duty at the time urged the remaining students to follow in kind and leave the field for their own safety. Meanwhile, science teacher Andrew Greenwood nearly jumped out of his shoes when an unnamed female student burst into his class, shouting something to the effect of, there's flying saucers outside. Though the girl quickly left, the class's attention was now understandably riveted to the windows, much to the teacher's consternation, as his lessons were not yet complete and the recess bell was not due to ring for another five to ten minutes. In a later interview with University of Arizona physicist James McDonald, Greenwood noted that he didn't take the girl's exclamation seriously, as he knew her to be somewhat excitable. His immediate impression was that it was in fact a prank designed to test his commitment to class discipline. In another room, Graham Simons, a chemistry student in a class taught by Barbara Robbins, recalled gazing out over the grounds behind the school while working on an experiment, only to see something in the sky he didn't recognize. Still on the oval, students Colin Kelly and Brendan Dixon watched as the strange object descended to about 9 to 10 meters off the ground, hovered momentarily, then rose straight up and continued over a series of electrical lines and behind a copse of pine trees located in a nearby nature preserve known as the Grange. A few moments after the initial sighting, several classes, along with Mr. Greenwood, Ms. Robbins, and English teacher Claude Miller, hurried outdoors, the chemistry teacher having the presence of mind to grab a camera and start taking several exposures, though it's unclear whether these were of the mounting chaos on the school grounds or of the UFO in question. Graham Simons later likened the scene to a herd of zebra escaping a lion, and fellow student Jeff Holland recounted what he described as a surging mob. Clearly, word of the unusual sight had gotten around. On a small truck farm located between the high school and the Grange, Westall alumnus Paul Smith was pulling carrots with his boss in preparation for market. Both men heard the commotion and subsequently became aware of the strange object in the sky behind them. Quote, We stood looking at it for several minutes. A few moments later, the children came over from the high school and they noticed us. It took a while to make up their minds if they would come onto our private property. They ran straight over across the market garden. Unquote. Indeed, though hesitant, as school was still in session and neither the truck farm nor the Grange were public land, many of the students, including Graham Simons, Terry Peck, Jacqueline Argent, and a girl named Tanya, jumped over the low fence running along the southern border of the Westall High Campus, hoping to see the object close up, as it was assumed to have landed while out of view behind the trees. It was later claimed by nebulous sources that Tanya, along with possibly another student, had fainted upon arrival at the landing site. Later, after being revived and returning to campus, it was claimed by some that Tanya suffered screaming convulsions so severe she was quickly put into an ambulance and whisked off, never to return. 
A notably curious account is given by Victor Zakruzny, who had been a Form 2 student at Westall High, equivalent to an 8th grader in the American school system. Zakruzny was adamant two objects had landed in the Grange, and that he and about a dozen students, in a different group from those who had jumped the low fence, had in fact closely approached both of them. Zakruzny had gotten close enough to one of the objects to actually contemplate placing a hand onto its surface, though he declined, considering the object seemed to be radiating a great deal of heat. Whether the young Zakruzny saw something or not, student Terry Peck arrived with her companions to find a large circular patch of grass, crushed and flattened as if by a great rotating weight. Peck described looking up almost at once to see a saucer-shaped object, quote, turn side on and just disappear into thin air, unquote. While the students were in the Grange, a young man who was later identified as Sean Matthews and whose family had leased the land for the adjustment of horses, approached the group to inform them they were trespassing, though the students told Matthews of a flying saucer and indicated the anomalous spot on the ground. He seemed completely disinterested and only grew more belligerent, demanding they vacate at once. Back on the school campus, Mr. Greenwood and student Jeff Holland watched several light aircraft, possibly Cessnas, come into view and cluster around the UFO. Greenwood opined the aircraft seemed to be playing a game of cat and mouse with a mysterious object. Holland elaborated further in an interview with the Clayton Calendar. Quote, As the aircraft approached, the thing tilted on about a 45-degree angle and started to move into the distance, gradually gaining height. The planes increased their speed and began to follow it, but the object streaked away, leaving the planes far, far behind. The planes turned back, and we all stood hoping it would return, but it didn't, so we all went into school 15 minutes late." Unquote. Considering the widespread breach of discipline that obviously resulted from an unauthorized exodus over the border fence, and the mass tardiness of perhaps a hundred or more students, the impact of the UFO sighting would linger on the air of the high school for some time. Even the Westall State Primary School next door didn't escape consequences. Although it's never been made clear just how many of the younger children had witnessed the goings-on, many of them had apparently been infected with the tension and fear generated by their older counterparts. The principal of the primary school, a Mr. L.G. Webster, had been out on business for the first part of the day. Upon returning during the lunch period, he found the children huddled in small groups, wide-eyed and afraid. The school's staff spent a considerable portion of time reassuring them they had nothing to worry about. At the high school, Headmaster Frank Sambleby had struck a conspicuously different tone over the whole affair. A man with a reputation for Monarchian thinking, Sambleby called an impromptu school-wide assembly after lunch, lambasting everyone for their behavior and willingness to believe in such rot as flying saucers. Specifically, he harshly reprimanded Graham Simons, who, having the title of school prefect and thus charged with being a good role model for his classmates, should have been more responsible and not followed the other students and teachers off the cliff of gullibility. Sambleby then informed the students that they had in fact seen nothing of consequence and that they were not to talk about it to anyone, not even themselves. Though impassioned, if not a bit naive, the headmaster's words would fall on deaf ears, as all of the witnesses promptly spilled the beans the moment the last bell rang. Even before then, reporters from both the Dandadong Journal and local Channel 9 television station arrived at the school that afternoon, likely notified by an anonymous call from one of the witnesses. Sambleby was not pleased. Student Marilyn Eastwood recalled later, quote, I got detention for appearing on the TV show, and then I got detention again later when my picture and story was in the Dented on the Journal." Unquote. The day following the sighting, uniformed men were seen at the school, possibly military. Graham Simons recalled witnessing his chemistry teacher at the end of a hall, confronted by Headmaster Sambleby and one of these men. Recalling that Ms. Robbins had taken many photographs the day of the event, Simons noted with some puzzlement that the men were demanding her to not only relinquish the film, but her entire camera. At another time, witness Jacqueline Argent was called from class and into Sambleby's office, where she was questioned by two well-dressed men. One of the men stated, We would like you to go through what you saw happen yesterday. After a series of probing questions, he finally commented, And I suppose you think you saw a flying saucer. Jacqueline stated that she in fact claimed only to have seen an object, to which the mysterious stranger mockingly joked about little green men. After another rebuke from Sambleby, Jacqueline then returned to her class angry and teary-eyed, understandably frustrated. The Dandadong Journal interviewed dozens of locals and even went so far as to contact Moribin Airport, only a few kilometers from the West Hall campus, attempting to glean any information about corroborating witnesses or air traffic at the time of the sighting. Oddly, controllers at the airport denied there were any aircraft in the sky at the time. Civilian interviews, likewise, turned up nothing of note. 
More puzzling is the complete dearth of information on the event in official circles. The Australian Department of Defense kept records of UFO sightings similar to Project Blue Book, the massive survey of UFO cases compiled by the United States Air Force. Many Australian sightings are in fact found in Blue Book files. In the late 1980s, researcher Keith Basterfield and a handful of others undertook the monumental task of searching through many hundreds of Australian government files regarding UFOs in the hopes of learning more about the Westall sighting. Quote, the net result is we found nothing in the mammoth volume of government documentation that would even begin to hint that there was something about Westall in the government files." Unquote. Cover-ups and nefarious cloak-and-dagger narratives aside, the first and most obvious question to ask is, did the students and the teachers at Westall High School see something unexplainable? Despite the impression given by Hollywood, eyewitness testimony is in many circles considered somewhat unreliable. One person's interpretation of events may or may not match another's, yet both may be telling what they consider to be the truth. This often makes for a multiplication of unknowns as the objective truth of a situation is pushed further away into shadow. One only has to consider the problem of investigating an automobile accident on a Manhattan thoroughfare during rush hour. Hundreds of potential witnesses would exist, but how many would actually give useful information? And how would one differentiate between useful information and well-articulated assumptions? Even worse, how would one determine who actually witnessed the crash as opposed to someone who arrived five minutes afterward just to ensure he was given face time on the six o'clock news. The only sensible method is to look at commonalities found in each account. If a thousand people all claimed the blue car rear-ended the taxi cab, it would be perfectly reasonable to assume such was a likely occurrence, even if everyone remembered the make and model of the offending blue car differently. It is without question that the students of Westhall High School saw something in the sky. At least four teachers are likely to have witnessed something as well, although only Andrew Greenwood has thus far come forth. It is likely at least half of the school's population was present, between two and three hundred individuals, though this number could be somewhat inflated. Known as the bandwagon effect in psychology, individuals who are very conscious of social status and cues, an apt description of a typical teenager, will often join a group narrative simply in an attempt to fit in. For comparison, consider a common admonition in years past that more people joined the French resistance in 1946 than in any year prior. But if we have or even quarter the estimation, at least 50 to 75 people were still party to the sighting, more than enough to raise an eyebrow. Overall, the sighting seems to have lasted between 20 and 30 minutes, divisible into two distinct periods, separated by a moment when the object was out of view behind the trees. The moment Mr. Greenwood joins the rest of the school on the oval, circumstances become somewhat muddled, as his recollections seem at odds with other witnesses. Greenwood claims to have had difficulty making visual contact with the UFO when he first arrived on the field, as there was very little contrast between it and the sky. Once a student pointed it out to him, he continued watching the UFO until its departure, accompanied by several light aircraft. He doesn't mention the UFO ever landing, though he does mention it briefly moving behind the trees. This is curious, considering his later entrance into the Grange with teacher Claude Miller, which would seem to indicate a belief that the UFO had indeed landed. Greenwood also gives a description of the object that is markedly different to that given by the students. He claimed the object was long and thin, shaped like a finger, with a small hump in the middle, perhaps five times longer than its width, and about two-thirds of the size of one of the small aircraft. He also claims the object changed shape spontaneously, though this is somewhat hard to reconcile with the tenuous nature of his vantage point. Although the time frame given by Greenwood of the object's final departure into the distance more or less matches up with that of student witnesses, he is quite insistent that the students jumped the fence while the object was still in view. This seems unlikely, as the students were somewhat reluctant to leave the campus to investigate, as stated by Jacqueline Argent and Paul Smith. Why would they have jumped the fence, a gross breach of discipline, and crossed onto private property if at least some of them did not believe the UFO had landed? Could Andrew Greenwood have in fact been looking at the wrong object? The possibility calls up a bizarre coincidence when viewed in a certain context. Collective testimony given by students indicates that initially the UFO was something silvery, silvery gray or silvery green, vaguely ovoid shape, and emitting either a low whirring noise or nothing at all as it passed through the sky. Though it's estimated about 15% of witnesses recall more than one object present, the vast majority claim only one UFO was ever in the sky at any one time. 
This could be due to the distortions inherent in decades-old memories, or a genuine misinterpretation caused by an encounter with a bizarre circumstance. Perhaps the object moved while temporarily out of view behind an observer or foreground structure, thus creating a false duplication in the minds of some observers. Regardless, the general behavior and appearance of the UFO initially seems to coincide with an errant stratospheric weather balloon, as suggested by researcher Keith Basterfield. Rather than a cliched attempt at dismissal, the idea of a weather balloon in this case is quite reasonable, up to a point. A balloon, specifically flight number 292, was launched two to three hours before the events at Westall from the Royal Australian Air Force Base in Laverton, about 30 kilometers to the northwest of the Westall campus. Part of a research program known as Highball, such balloon launches were a common occurrence in 1960s Australia, utilized by both the scientific community for astronomical study and the military for the detection of atmospheric radiation, a telltale sign of foreign nuclear weapons testing. The winds over Laverton were blowing from a westerly direction, as was common for that time of year, placing the Highball launch on a course more or less toward Clayton South and the Grange. It is entirely plausible, then, that the balloon drifted into view and caught the attention of classmates on the oval. Weather balloons like that employed by Project Highball are typically several meters in diameter when launched, and inevitably expand as they rise, their internal pressure far exceeding that exerted upon their exterior by the ever-thinning atmosphere. Ironically, some designs cause the balloon to expand into a distinctly disc-like shape, looking very much like the classic UFO saucers of B-movie lore. Once launched, weather balloons will reach 2 to 3 kilometers altitude within a 2 hour time span. For it to be visible at all to anyone at Westall, the balloon would have to be seriously malfunctioning, a not unheard of occurrence certainly, but one which would likely cause the balloon to be misshapen and very weird in appearance. The balloon could have descended prematurely, then simply limped along for a few moments until it disappeared into the trees out of everyone's view. The fact that many witnesses were and are still very insistent they weren't seeing a balloon is understandable considering the twofold disadvantage of low atmospheric contrast at that distance and the undoubtedly non-balloon-like shape of a deflating gas bag. Moreover, it was standard procedure for a highball to be tracked and pursued by a light aircraft similar to the ones reported by Greenwood in Holland. Upon the balloon's inevitable descent, the designated aircraft would remotely signal the instrument package beneath the balloon to detach and fall to the earth via parachute, where it would be later retrieved by a ground crew. This fact seems to coincide somewhat with the testimony of Paul Smith, who noted several military-style vehicles had arrived on the landing site within a few minutes. That this retrieval team was, as Paul Smith's description, dressed in foreign military uniforms, likely United States Air Force, is not really all that strange. The United States and Australia performed many joint operations during the Cold War, particularly operations that scrutinized nuclear activity in the Soviet Union. It is possible, then, that rather than a balloon, the witnesses had in fact observed the final descent of an approximately 12-meter-wide parachute, the shape of which closely resembles some artistic renderings, as well as heard the drone of the overhead chase plane, which could reasonably be described as a whirring noise. But this seems to stretch credulity when considered against the chronology of the events. Even if one were to take Greenwood's most conservative estimation of only five minutes delay after the girl's breathless announcement and add a scant one minute before and after that period for a total observation time, how does one explain a parachute traveling through the sky more or less horizontally for what amounts to at least seven minutes? Could the balloon have fallen from the sky at the same time and in the same area as the parachute? The likelihood that once detached, a relatively buoyant object like a descending balloon would come down in the Grange at the exact moment its associated instrument package parachuted to Earth is remote, to say the least, and though by no means impossible, would admittedly have to be the coincidence of the century. But Greenwood's account necessitates just such a coincidence, unless his recollection of the order of events is inaccurate, or of course, the UFO was neither a balloon nor a parachute. There is also the possibility that any parachute was in fact not related to a hypothetical balloon, but was a target drogue towed by one of the aircraft for an unrelated training exercise. This would explain the cat-and-mouse-like behavior described by Greenwood, as pilots in training would be maneuvering their craft in an evasive manner to keep the drogue in their respective sights. This would also explain the strange appearance of Greenwood's UFO as opposed to the students, if they were indeed two separate objects. But again, this would require a very unlikely coincidence. Two completely unconnected aerial exercises occurring at the same place and at the same time. 
close enough to actually be conflated with one another by ground-based witnesses. The training exercise would also seem to be discounted by more of an airport's denial of any air traffic at the time. Though considering the fact that Moribin is one of the busiest airports in the Southern Hemisphere in number of takeoffs, averaging several thousand flights per week, this denial seems rather bizarre. If the more sensational accounts, such as that given by Victor Zakruzny, are entirely accurate, one would expect for the student fence jumpers to have also encountered a sizable group already in the Grange, hopelessly confusing any possible timeline. This isn't to say Mr. Zakruzny is being untruthful, but his recollections may be faulty or inadvertently conflated with other unrelated memories. The fact that one crucial detail of his account is probably inaccurate, that he was at the landing site before and apart from some of his classmates, calls into serious doubt the other details offered by him, including descriptions and sketches of the object's size and appearance. But other students who entered the Grange did at least note a flattened circular patch of grass before being ejected from the property by Sean Matthews. Contrary to the student's claims of his blasé attitude, Matthews indicated in a later interview with Melbourne newspaper The Sunday Age he had indeed seen a strange object enter and exit the trees. Quote, I saw the thing come across the horizon and drop down behind the trees and saw it leave again. Unquote. Estimating it to be about the size of two family cars, Matthews went further to say, quote, It was silvery, but it had a sort of purple hue to it, very bright, but not bright enough that you couldn't look at it. Unquote. Why Matthews did not call attention to these facts and corroborate the student's admittedly outlandish story is somewhat puzzling, and Matthews himself offers no explanation. It is possible, though, that once the object left the Grange, Matthews prioritized the trespassers as the most immediate problem, and thus refrained from fueling their curiosity and encouraging further encroachment onto his family's property. If students such as Terry Peck were correct, and there was some sort of circle formed in the tall grass, it should be noted that it was not permanent and was not again mentioned by anyone apart from one-off recollections decades after the story had become public knowledge. However, this doesn't mean the circle didn't exist. It is quite likely a circle or roughly circular patch of crushed grass could have been at the site, but since no credible account positively connects a landed craft with such, its association should be seen as spurious at best. As mentioned, Mr. Greenwood and Mr. Miller also jumped the southern fence to investigate. Greenwood had heard some of the children had found what he colloquially termed a UFO nest and wanted to see for himself. Quote, we tried to see what we could find. There were reports from several groups of children later on that they'd seen one of those typical nests. It would have been the perfect area to see one in. Lots of long grass. But I didn't see one myself, though I looked around for quite a while. Unquote. Were the two men simply in a less suggestive frame of mind? Or were they simply looking in the wrong spot? And what of the mysterious and eerie fate of the witness known as Tanya? Because of the ephemeral nature of her part in the overall narrative and the difficulty in locating her since the events in 1966, indeed Greenwood himself never even mentions her in any accounting, it has been suggested by some investigators that her very existence is in doubt, but such a conclusion would necessitate either gross deception or delusion by classmates such as Jacqueline Argent, who are absolutely adamant about her participation. It could be that Tanya was a student as well as a UFO witness, and that her later departure from the school grounds may have been an unconnected occurrence. This theory is supported by a statement made by former student Lance Brown. Quote, In that two-month period I'd been at school, Tanya had been quite notorious to say the least, but when she vanished I didn't relate it to the UFO, more her wild ways. Unquote. No one apart from Victor Zakruzny ever mentioned seeing a landed craft, grounded balloon, or spent parachute. Others, such as Terry Peck, claimed to have seen a circle in the grass and a strange object in the sky directly above, a strong implication that the two were related. If the UFO was in fact a downed highball balloon or parachute from an associated flight, one would expect the students would find it, as by all accounts they had arrived on the scene a considerable amount of time before any ground crew could secure the area. It is conceivable a partially deflated balloon might be lifted back up off the ground by a small gust of wind, but it is very unlikely it would have had enough buoyancy to quickly rise above the treetops and make the kind of rapid departure as that reported by Greenwood and students Jeff Holland and Brendan Dixon. That a total of four to six aircraft were seen in the area is an interesting and perhaps telling detail. 
A chase plane was a vital component of highball missions, without which recovery of sensitive hardware and telemetry would have been very difficult. Granted, there would have been no need for as many aircraft as was reported, but considering the normally high volume of air traffic in the region, having other unassociated planes in the sky at the time would not be much of a stretch. But if the UFO was in fact a parachute from a highball balloon, why wasn't any chase plane seen when the UFO first appeared? No aircraft were observed by witnesses until after the recess bell rang, a minimum of 5 to 10 minutes. Some reported the UFO had emitted a noise that could reasonably be described as a conventional aircraft engine, but the close proximity of Moribin Airport to the school would seem to suggest such sounds were a common occurrence. Why would so many not recognize the sound if that was indeed what it was? Considering the difficulty Greenwood had in making visual contact with the unknown object due to the lack of atmospheric contrast, it is very possible a single aircraft was in the air and went unnoticed for some time. Any noise created by said aircraft could have been erroneously associated with the UFO, as it was so commonplace that students and teachers normally tuned it out. A group of aircraft would seemingly give credence to the theory of a target drogue and could possibly explain some of the object's movements if the lead aircraft was circling the area, waiting for the other aircraft to arrive on scene. Most light aircraft of the type later described by Holland, Greenwood, and others usually fly in excess of 100 knots, or about 200 kilometers per hour. And while a towed drogue can certainly exhibit darting evasive behavior, that is the whole point of its use, some of the maneuvers described, particularly by Mr. Greenwood, are quite curious. For example, in his interview with James McDonald, Greenwood indicated the object hovered several times, accelerated rapidly, sometimes crossing as much as 30 degrees to one side or the other, moved toward and away from the gathered crowd, yet always maintaining a distance of at least 500 meters, and bobbed up and down. Though the object usually made rapid movements, there were times it seemed to drift. Of course, in Greenwood's case, these are details about something seen at least a year earlier. To have such memories be totally free of distortion would be more puzzling than the UFO itself. Stories of military cover-ups are by nature conspiratorial and often lead to conclusions of questionable veracity. Many times these stories are comprised of second or third-hand hearsay or a first-hand observation of something with a multitude of possible interpretations. The idea that any government's military complex would want to suppress any evidence regarding bona fide UFOs, that is, craft of a non-earthly origin, is actually quite reasonable when one considers the possible threats to national security and public safety. If a government had reason to believe that objects were inserting themselves into national airspace and affecting maneuvers far beyond the capabilities of current technology, it would not want to risk the widespread civil unrest that would result in such information becoming widely known. The deep-set confidence one has in their country's latest nuclear submarine would suffer somewhat if faced with a threat from a flying craft that can seemingly disobey the laws of physics. If some decidedly more down-to-earth activity were involved, such as an experimental aircraft or clandestine spying project, one would expect a similar air of secrecy, albeit for a totally different reason. If the American or Australian military were spying on the Soviets, such information would be kept under wraps to prevent the Soviets from finding out and concocting some form of countermeasure. Many highball balloon flights had at least partially secretive purposes. To have Barbara Robbins film seized would be a reasonable and most likely legal course of action. That her entire camera was taken is not really relevant. There is no way of knowing if the camera was simply returned to her at a later time. The fact that many students were ordered not to speak with the media is also understandable considering Headmaster Sambleby's stern and straightforward method of performing his job. Undoubtedly, he would quickly tire of disruptions to the school's learning environment. Clearly, Sambleby did not believe in, nor have any patience with, anyone who believed in UFOs. He would have likely viewed the entire affair as a distraction and an affront to his duties as Headmaster. There is also no reason to doubt Jacqueline Argent's claim of being questioned in Sambleby's office, but the claim should be considered from the viewpoint of the two officials as well as the understandably anxious girl. Could they have been simply trying to learn if Ms. Argent saw a downed secret balloon? The fact that she suggested she saw something she couldn't readily identify was likely enough to put them at ease. And in any case, the very fact that the Westall UFO sighting became such public knowledge immediately following the event speaks to any supposed cover-up as either hopelessly inept or entirely non-existent. Australian newspapers such as the Dandenong Journal and school periodicals such as the Clayton Calendar were not in any way hindered in publishing. 
Andrew Greenwood, the only teacher witness vocal on the subject, was not prevented from being interviewed by either physicist James McDonald only a year after the event, or by investigator James J. Kibble at a later time. And as late as 2008, Greenwood did claim to investigator Shane Ryan that a pair of uniformed men, presumably a Royal Australian Air Force officers, visited his home a week after the event and threatened to spread unfounded rumors of him being an alcoholic if he spoke about the UFO. The fact that he made no mention of this threat 40 years earlier when it was presumably fresh on his mind seems very strange. No threat was ever carried out and no salacious rumors ever materialized, despite giving prodigious amounts of information to McDonald, a man who had neither motivation nor intention to keep quiet. Could this be an indication of a fault in Greenwood's memory, or could it simply be an embellishment added at a later time? It is tempting to conclude the entire event was purposefully expunged, but there is no reason to believe this out of hand as the Australian government is no more immune to the imperfections of bureaucracy than any other. A host of unrelated documents from the era are probably also missing for one reason or another, but since Basterfield and his team were not looking for those, their absence was not noted. It is also possible all Westall-related material was simply sent abroad for further scrutiny to either the Ministry of Defense in England or the Blue Book offices in the Pentagon. Then again, if the Westall UFO was in fact something already known to authorities, perhaps they didn't even classify it as a UFO in the first place. Noting the close proximity of the Moribin Airport, many skeptics and investigators have theorized an unknown experimental aircraft was responsible for the sighting. As pointed out by writer Brian Dunning, this seems unlikely in light of the limited nature of Australia's aircraft industry of the day. Most manufacturing was centered around the small civilian variety and not something high performance or futuristic, akin to the American Skunk Works. Could the United States have been testing something in an ally's airspace? With millions of square kilometers of Australian outback, one struggles to understand the sense in flying a super secret aircraft near one of the continent's most populated cities. Throughout the years, more efforts have been made to throw light on a supposed cover-up than on the origins and nature of the Westall UFO itself, an odd and somewhat off-putting fact that perhaps says more about human nature than one would care to admit. Mistrust and paranoia seem to trump curiosity and wonder. Taken by themselves, each account of the UFO Westall sighting seems a probable case of misidentification. Neither weather balloons nor target droves are a common sight for the general population, certainly not for high schoolers, whom could be forgiven for not recognizing what they were looking at. But as a whole, such explanations seem to only generate more questions, most of which will likely go unanswered. Perhaps the students and teachers of Westall High School were a fortunate lot and caught a glimpse of a reality most of us miss during our busy lives. Or perhaps the tale is nothing more than a bubbling witch's brew of collective memory, a fleeting and uncertain thing in the best of times.